All right. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for tuning in to watch my little talk today. So uh, before I begin, I just wanted to give a big shout out to the organizers who have been such good sports and so very helpful in making this talk and basically the entire conference a reality. Uh, I love that we're getting more conferences in Norway with a focus on practical and technical artificial intelligence. I look forward to learning a lot from the rest of the speech today, things that I can take with me to work and use to do a better job tomorrow. And that is also the goal for my own presentation today, to give you something that you can take with you to work tomorrow and feel like an even better data scientist. Um, also a small phone disclaimer first, this is actually the first time I record myself following a presentation. Uh, I did a podcast once, but I must admit I actually never dared to listen to it after. Um, I can imagine this is kind of how it feels to do the obligatory one take scene that every action movie with respect for itself needs to have. Uh, I'm not sure I can give George Clooney and Sandra Bullock or Clive Owen in Alfonso Cuaron's masterpieces a run for their money, but I'm going to give it an honest try. All right. So who am I? Well, my name is Jatul Omlal Savik, and uh, for the purposes of this presentation, um, there are only two things that you need to know about me. So uh, the first part is my background. Um, I kind of weasel my way into the data science field through my master's degree, which is a combination of business, economics, and systems engineering, which landed me a job in business intelligence. And um, quickly, I figured out it was more fun to teach models to solve problems for me than it was to actually solve the problem myself. So from there on, I went to start a data science team at Elchef Nordic. And uh, now I'm responsible for data science as, uh, at Colonial.no as of the start of 2019. And I'm very much an applied kind of data scientist. I like to solve real problems and make things that work. And then the second thing you need to know about me is my favorite thing to do in the world. Um, some people like skiing, some people like biking, some people like to take long walks on the beach, but me, I like to watch lost values of machine learning models plummet to the ground in my terminal or in my notebook. And uh, what's that got me in life? Well, it's got me a few kind of medals every now and then. Not that much to write home about, I suppose, but it's something. Um, I have to admit, I haven't been that active on Kaggle uh, since I joined Coronel.no, uh, because there are so many interesting problems to solve at work. So why would I do machine learning on other data than our own data? Yeah, it's a luxury. So my actually, my, my job is kind of my hobby, which is, uh, I guess, a, a double-edged sword, but yeah, that's how it is. Anyway, um, so about Coronel.no. Um, I usually start these presentations by asking people how many have heard of us and how many are regular customers, how many have tried us, etc. But obviously, I can't do that today. So I'm just going to assume that you're all super loyal customers who have heard about Colonel.no and love the products. Well, no, actually, uh, so uh, Colonel.no um, is an independent startup. It was started in 2013 by 10 tech and marketing nerds who knew next to nothing about grocery retail. And they got together and decided to grocery. And uh, since then, we have grown to be Norway's largest and most affordable gross online grocery store, um, which is something that makes us happy but not satisfied. We believe that nobody has actually cracked the code for how to do like what groceries is going to look like in the future. And um, but we also believe that we are the ones getting there with high speed. And while we do sell groceries, we fundamentally self-identify as a technology and logistics company. And uh, we believe that these things will be the key to building the future of all forms of retail, uh, not just groceries. So as a result of this belief, we have built almost all our technology ourselves from the ground up, which is our competitive advantage. And we believe that this is what will allow us to realize insane amounts of business value from our data science efforts. It's easier to build better product with your data when said data is not being held hostage by SAP in Germany. All right, so what do we want? What do you want to do? So we want to give our customers freedom and flow in their everyday lives. And uh, by making groceries into something, it just happens for them, uh, flow, so to speak. Uh, we provide our customers with the freedom to do the things that they actually want to do, such as spending time with their kids, gardening, cooking, skydiving, or watching Lost Values degrees. Um, and while it's a fluffy ambition, 
uh, we kind of feel like we're delivering on it for many of our customers. Because if you if you frequent circles uh, where people tend to talk about logistics related to kindergarten, uh, school, or children's leisure activities, uh, you're bound to have run into somebody uh, who believes Quotinel.no is absolutely fundamental um, to their daily lives to, to make everything, well, to make the wheel spin, so to speak. Um, and the way that we give customers freedom and flow is to build the world's most efficient retail system. And notice that it doesn't say grocery retail. Uh, we, ob we obviously do this for our customers uh, to provide them with the best possible customer experience. But we also do it to prove to ourselves and to the world that our way to do retail is the right way, not the least from an, environment, uh, sorry, from an environmental perspective, where we allow ourselves the idealism of thinking that this way of doing groceries is better for the planet in the end. Uh, yes. All right, so what does this have to do with data? Well, we have this model for how we think about value creation from data at Cornell uh, So when you own the entire value chain of what you do, uh, the potential for creating value with data is vast. And there are many ways to create value with data. Sometimes you create value by building dashboards or performing analysis work. And other times you create value by building machine models that provide advanced decision support or automate entire tasks in the customer experience or in our logistics. And in data and insight in Colonial.no, we work across this whole spectrum. And there is a whole bunch of interesting use cases that have nothing to do with machine learning for us. But today, the focus is on the applied machine learning part. And uh, data science at Pulinial.no lives mostly on the right side of the diagram uh, on this slide, uh, figuring how, out how to solve problems with algorithms. That is what we do for the most part. All right. So this is where I was hoping to start providing some useful thoughts and ideas that you can take with you to work tomorrow. So my motivation for wanting to hold a talk about applied data science and boosting in the first place is to feel that there are a lot of ideas flying around about what makes a good data scientist, and that most of those ideas actually miss the mark on what makes a data scientist uniquely valuable and what skills are likely to generate business value for companies. Uh, first of all, I think if you want to make stuff that works, you should strive to be a good developer. So not all software development practices apply to machine learning pipelines, but many of them do. And yes, you should be good at analyzing data as well, but I believe that if there is to be a meaningful distinction between a data science and analyst roles, then a data scientist should be an engineer first and an analyst second. And a data analysis for the purpose of business decision, sorry, business decision intelligence is a different game. It's no less important. In fact, it's probably more important, but it's different nonetheless. All right, so one more thing you should be really disciplined with is validation. You should be really disciplined when it comes to validating your results and having a keen sense about what generalization looks like when you're solving problems with machine learning. I might get some pushback for this, but I believe that the points one and two on this list are more important than having in-depth knowledge of, of algorithms or most data scientist positions, unless you're working at the cutting edge of some field. Uh, so the data scientist who is adept at making awesome dot fit dot predict data pipelines with robust validation schemes is much more likely to generate business value than the one who can calculate gradients and hessians on a napkin blindfolded. Uh, if you have to pick one or the other, of course you can have both go ahead, but usually, usually you can't. So supervised learning works. Um, if you're really good at formulating problems in terms of X's and Y's for which you have good data, you can make machine learning work for you and not against you. And uh, think of it as creating on point job descriptions for your models. You should also be a bit careful in spending too much time with pure and supervised learning solutions for difficult problems um, when you don't have the data to do supervised learning. Sure, you can try, but uh, you should cut your losses early in such cases and instead just collect the data to do supervised learning. It's usually a better idea. Um, you usually come across two types of supervised learning problems in industry, like straight up tabular problems, you know, your Excel sheet or your standard database table. Um, 
or you have problems that have some kind of temporal or sequential, spatial, other dimensionality to it. The most obvious examples of the latter are time series, text, images, sound, and videos. Uh, but you can easily find more exotic things, like, for example, someone's shopping history, which again consists of shopping baskets with products and other features. You can always convert such problems into tabular problems, but using models that can take advantage of the inherent structure of the data can both reduce complexity in feature engineering and increase accuracy on the problem. And speaking of complexity, uh, as a data scientist, you should be good at considering the complexity of the entire solution that you're building and not get hung up on parts of it. So if, you use a complex, if you, using a complex model gets you out of a bunch of feature engineering code, you should probably do it. It generally doesn't matter if you use a complex algorithm when it's implemented with the dot fit method of a, of a battle-tested machine learning library. Uh, a long pipeline with lots of clever feature engineering, scaling, and encoding to be able to get decent performance with a simple method in the end is uh, it's much more complex to debug and to maintain. And uh, by the same token, if you're working with multidimensional data that has some temporal, spatial, or other dimension, uh, like shopping carts, for example, uh, keeping the data in its original representation and feeding it to the appropriate neural net uh, will save you a lot of feature engineering and save you from making a lot of assumptions. The same is true if you want to combine different types of data or if you have multiple labels or tasks uh, you need to solve at the same time. So keep it as simple as possible, but not simpler than that. That is my mantra. There are plenty of reasons to use complex algorithms that have nothing to do with accuracy on solving the problem. So calling out, you don't need deep learning for that, or you can solve that within your regression all the time is missing the point. You can do computer vision without neural networks too, but that doesn't mean you should. And likewise, you should be, be pragmatic about interpretability. If you're good at valid, uh, good validation and you don't need interpretability to deliver results on the problem, don't get hung up on it. But of course, feel free to use explainability techniques for your own sake to build a better solution. Feature importances and, and something like shaft values can be very useful for this. And finally, don't forget to nurture your creativity and intuition. The field of machine learning is extremely empirical in the sense that we know quite a bit about what works, but rarely that's about why it works. That means that data, science, uh, that data science is perfect turf for those of us who like to perform a lot of experience and try new things. Sure, you shouldn't go down too far down every rabbit hole, uh, but you should trust your intuition and uh, dare to have opinions and dare to make some bets every now and then. So you should, uh, reading this and listening to this, you should keep in mind that my beliefs are colored by the fact that I mostly work within domains where machine learning cases tend to be low to medium risk. Um, it doesn't matter that much if you make a wrong product recommendation now every now and then or a wrong forecast every now and then. Uh, the picture might be different if you're working within the health sector or with public sector case management, for example. So you should apply your own judgment on this uh, based on your own context, of course. So what does all this have to do with boosting anyway? Well, we all know that there is no such thing as a free lunch. But that is not an argument that you need to know everything. And some lunches are indeed better than others. So boosting is one of the most applicable lunches on the menu. It's the safe all-rounder that you can order for your kids every time. They love it. It doesn't cost a lot. Yeah, it's a happy meal. Uh, it's the one method that is most likely to give you the best balance between complexity and performance and time to market for your model in most cases. So with that said, let's dive into the details on how to create great ML pipelines with boosting. So the first part is actually formulating the problem. And um, I'm not sure, I don't know about you, but I, I often see people making statements like this, like yeah, machine learning is so stupid, super woke. When, when people do that, I, this is what I hear. Uh, I think that if you, if you think machine learning is so stupid, you're probably not all that great at it. The thing is that machine learning is a great tool if you know how to make it do what you want. So what you should strive to do is actually formulate the problem uh, in terms of excess and a label that actually gives you what you want. And if you do this right, you want to try to outsmart your model as you work. So this is, a, this, is a, this is a very important thing. And part of this is also carefully considering things as like what loss function to use and how you might weigh different samples or classes using some sort of weighting scheme 
all of this is is part of like solving the right problem, and it is generally, in my mind, in my opinion, a lot more important than trying every algorithm in the curriculum. It's much more important to get loss function and and sample weighting and class weighting, like uh, co completely right. But of course, you do need to pick a library, um, and here you have uh, three cool, three really good choices in the area of boosting. So you have the classical around the RexG boost, the first one to take Haggle by storm. Then there's the quick and nimble light GBM, which came along a bit later uh, from Microsoft. And then there's the clever newcomer cat boost from the good guys at Yandex, the, uh, the, the uh, Russian equivalent of Google. Uh, any of these algorithms should do the job. Pick your favorite. Uh, they all have their strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I won't go into details on that today. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of blog posts uh, you can read on this as well. So feature engineering. How do you generate features for such uh, for boosting model pipelines? Well, uh, feature engineering is often hailed for its importance. And like the reason that machines won't replace data scientists anytime soon, well, I got to say, I'm sorry, I'm calling it. I think automated feature engineering, automated feature selection, automated feature elimination is going to be the standard practice in not too many years. Um, I think the most important part of feature engineering uh, when you're working with uh, boosting models is to make sure the information is actually there for the model to learn from. Uh, if you try to be too clever, uh, you usually only get worse results. I like to just create features based on like some feeling about what might be related to my label uh, in a greedy manner. And then I let the model figure out what works and what doesn't. Every time I try to be clever with this, it usually just reduces performance, in my opinion. And if you want to take advantage of domain knowledge in your model, I suggest adding it as a feature first and, and, and try that first. Um, instead of trying to control your model with a lot of business logic, um, I think that's part of letting the model actually do its, do its job. And it will also save you from maintaining the, the aforementioned business logic. Um, of course, you shouldn't shy away from a few simple rules now and then. But still, it's good to try this before, uh, this first. And if you are worried about the model not learning the appropriate relationship between like, your, your uh, business domain feature and your label, you can enforce monotonicity constraints on the model you can uh, it's, it's a very it's a very clever feature of the boosting models which allows you to to determine the uh, to, to force the model to have a certain direction in the uh, in the relationship between a feature and a label all right more feature engineering one of the things that uh, many data scientists do is one hot encode categorical features so that if you have three uh, a categorical feature with three values, it becomes three binary columns with a one or a zero. Uh, for many models, you need to do this. For boosting models, you don't. Um, all you have to do is map your uh, values to map the, the categorical feature values to integers, so there are no strings. And then you can just dot fit away. Uh, this works with all the libraries. If you're using LightGBM, you can just keep uh, the uh, keep the features as a standard pandas categorical column, and then you can just tell LightGBM that this is a categorical feature. This doesn't always increase performance, though. So uh, you and sometimes also if you have very high cardinality uh, categorical features with a lot of values, uh, you will get out of memory errors on on if you're running on GPU. So uh, yeah, it might it might not always work the way you think. Uh, but if you're using CatBoost, you should definitely use the built-in categorical feature functionality because it has some really clever way ways of handling categorical features. Uh, but yeah, one of encoding, don't need to do that. Uh, if you have very high cardinality features, you might benefit from using another encoding scheme, like something like some sort of binary encoding. Um, I don't have time to cover that today. So yeah, I'll just get to the next point. So I don't, you usually, you also don't have to bother with scaling or transforming features like in general. Uh, so boosting models, like three based models in general, are resistant to the uh, to these things. Uh, but transforming the target, like your label, is another matter that might work. Uh, and in very many cases, uh, a log transform is your friend. 
Right, validation and feature selection. Now I'm going to start showing off uh, some of the tools that we have at Cronel.no to make this as easy as possible. So we have this um, our our data science repository is called uh, uh, it's called Fabrica, which is uh, Spanish for fact. Sorry, Spanish for factory, I believe, uh, which has some functionality for easily performing common tasks in machine learning pipelines. Um, so one thing, this is extremely important. So you always want to have a really good validation strategy for your model and for your pipeline. And this will almost never be a uh, like vanilla cross validation scheme with random, uh, random, uh, random indices. It will almost always be some sort of back testing, some sort of we take this past data and then we validate the model on future data. This is often the most common way to, uh, the best way to do this is to use something called walk forward validation, where you take a slice of the data that you train on and then you validate on the next, uh, on, let's say, um, well, actually we can, we can take the example that is in the screenshot here. So I have 730 days of data to train on and then I test it on the, uh, then I do that and then I validate on the horizon the next 84 days. Then I walk forward 42 days, which is the period. Uh, and then I train again and validate on the next 84 days. Then I walk forward 42 days, validate on the next 84, and I do that for maybe one year of data. Then, then in that way, I have tested my model's generalization on basically an entire year of data. So, yeah. All right. Um, when you have created a lot of features, if you've done this in like a greedy manner, uh, you usually end up with a lot of features, which will make model training very slow. So, and, and some of your features might not work at all. So what you want to do is that you want to get rid of very weak features and you can use the feature importances um, uh, functionality in the boosting libraries to do this. So just maybe set a threshold for how important a feature needs to be. And then you throw out everything that's below that. That usually gets, lets you get rid of a lot of, a lot of trash. And then there is uh, the combination of creating features in a greater manner and having a problem where, which has a significant temporal dimension like forecasting, where you really need to consider that your model needs to work on future data that uh, might be where, where, where things might have changed. Uh, you, you should consider using some form of adversarial validation to eliminate features uh, with relationships that don't generalize well to future data. This is basically one one way to do this is to try to create a classification model to try to separate your training to try to predict whether a certain uh, whether your data whether data is training data or validation data, and then you will get some sort of uh, then you if you then look at the feature importances you will see which features are are valuable for distinguishing training and test data, and what you want to do then is you want to try to train without those features for example and you see if it increases validation performance. This is quite important to do. Usually adding features in most problems usually doesn't make validation performance uh, worse, but for time series problems in particular, uh, this might happen, so be careful. All right, hyperparameter tuning, the fun part. I, um, I personally used to think that I was adding a lot of value by manually tuning hyperparameters, and then at some point, I started using automated hyperparameter tuning and both my own workflow and my models are better for it. Um, you need to spend a little bit of time coming up with reasonable ranges for different hyperparameters. But other than that, you should just throw a lot of compute cycles at it and do something productive, productive while the machine figures out, figures it all out. And um, I usually use uh, Optuna uh, for this. It's a great library, it works very well. It has support for a lot of algorithms and you can use it with any machine learning library. So uh, I, 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 I really recommend Optuna, try it out. Uh, so something you should not tune, you should not tune the uh, learning rate or the number of iterations on boosting models. So what you wanna do is you wanna set a learning rate that doesn't make hyperparameter tuning take a prohibitively long time. Because if you set low learning rates, your model will train for a long time. If you set high learning rates, it will train for a, a lot shorter. So what you do is you set a reasonable 
a learning rate, and then you use early stopping to find the number of iterations uh, when you're doing cross-validation. Just remember that when you use early stopping during cross-validation, you will get optimistic uh, accuracy estimates because you're actually overfitting uh, the number of iterations for each fold. And that is fine. We'll deal with it later uh, when we train the final model. And yeah, this is uh, this on the screenshot. This is the hyperparameter research uh, function uh, functionality that we have in in Coronado Teno. It's just a single line of code, and uh, yeah, you're good to go. All right. So when you have figured out the best hyperparameters, you have a good set of features that you want to use. Uh, you've eliminated ones that don't generalize. You have uh, eliminated ones that are weak, and your hyperparameters are good. Then what you want to do is you want to lower the learning rate maybe by a factor of five to 10, depending on how low it is in the first place. Um, and then you want to do a final round of walk forward cross validation or whatever validation scheme that you have set up for your pipeline with early stopping. And the reason you're doing this is you want to find the number of iterations uh, that you want to train your final model on because you do want to train your model on all the data in the end. Uh, this, this is especially important for uh, time series problems, because if you use the last n days as holdout data and never train on it, you will not be able to have a model that learns from the most recent data. So a simple way to do this is just take the average number of iterations that you got from uh, all the folds in, in step one. Uh, but you need to keep in mind that you have to adjust for the fact that you are adding more training data when you're adding the final model. So if when you train on all the data, you are training on 30% more data than you do in every iteration of cross-validation, you, you need to also multiply the number of iterations by 1.3. And you shouldn't really worry about overfitting by training boosting modes too long when you're doing it with low learning rates. They generally don't overfit in these cases. Uh, I think underfitting from not training long enough is, is, is worse. It happens more often. All right, that's it. Now you are ready to go out there and build great machine learning pipelines with boosting. Well, of course, there is a lot more to this than I'm able to cover in an hour. Uh, I at least I, was, uh, I hope I was able to give you some, give you some good advice uh, from my personal experience. And maybe pique your interest. If there is a lot of interest in this, I might consider following up this talk with a workshop on machine learning pipelines with boosting later on. You can send me a message or or whatever on, on LinkedIn, maybe if you if you would be interested in something like that, then maybe maybe I can set it up. So I hope you'll allow me to end my talk with a shameless recruitment pitch. If you love solving real problems with data and like what you heard today, you should know that Colonial.no is growing at an insane pace right now and that we're looking for product analysts, data engineers, and of course, data scientists to help us create the retail experience of tomorrow and, and, and crack the code. So if you want to learn more about this, you can swing by our career pages. Um, not all the positions that we need in the data uh, sphere are listed at the moment, but if you shoot me a message on LinkedIn, I'll be more than happy to provide a link to the different role descriptions and answer any questions that you might have. All right, so I guess that's it for today. Thanks again for tuning in, and thanks again to the organizers for setting everything up. I hope you all enjoyed listening to this talk as much as I enjoyed making it. Uh, enjoy the rest of the conference and have a great day.